It's now time to move on to the motion, this house would populate Mars. And I look to Chris Collins, press and sponsorship officer, to open the case for the proposition. Well, thank you so much, Madam President, for calling on me to open this stellar debate tonight. I know there are a lot of people who'd like to see the Oxford Union move to the Red Planet, uh, probably sooner rather than later. But I, for one, am tremendously keen to be here proposing this motion. But before I do so, it falls to me to introduce the eminent and uh, eloquent individuals who will try in vain to convince you to reject the motion today. Speaking first, we have Mr. Joshua Platt, a first year law student from St. Hilda's College. Despite all evidence to the contrary, Josh insists that he is not a Martian, uh, but, instead, <laughs> <laughs> but instead hails from the Channel Islands, so I'm sure he will doubtless see the potential of Mars as the university's largest tax haven. <laughs> Speaking second, we have Dr. Sylvia Ekstrom, who is a scientific collaborator at the Geneva Observatory with more than 200 publications on astronomy and astrophysics, and who is currently working uh, on research into stellar physics. Speaking third, we have a man who may be able to settle the question of Josh's Martianness, the uh, Chancellor's Fellow in Astrobiology at the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Sean McMahon, uh, who focuses on how uh, traces of ancient life in rocks on Earth could resemble those found on Mars. And speaking last but not least is Dr. Anjana Ahuja, science columnist for the Financial Times and a specialist on the social issues surrounding science. She is author of a best-selling book about the COVID-19 pandemic, and so we'll be delighted to hear that Mars has never reported any cases of COVID-19. Uh, and she has a PhD in space physics from Imperial College London. Madam President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. Now I'm a classic student, so I don't know a lot about Mars, except that he was the father of Romulus and Remus. His Greek name was Arius, and he was, of course, the Roman god of war. But what I do know is that more majestic than Mars the god, more thrilling even than Mars the chocolate bar, <laughs> is that magnificent ruby, Mars the planet. 52 and a half years ago, when we went to the moon, we did so because of a rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. If we were to go to Mars today, it's more likely to be because of a rivalry between the leaders of Amazon and Tesla. I leave it to you to decide which is more terrifying. <laughs> but what we hope to show you tonight is that there are valid reasons for all of us, putting aside the geopolitics and the billionaires' egos, to be genuinely excited about the prospect of exploring the Red Planet. And the first reason for this, of course, is the tremendous opportunities for scientific discovery on Mars itself. During the evolution of Mars, we think that the planet underwent an in incredible transformation. A world that was once perhaps a bit like Earth is now the dry and barren planet that we see today. Populating Mars would let us understand why this happened, why climates and planets change and evolve in this way, and it's obvious to see how this would really revolutionize our understanding uh, of our own planet and of the many others in the solar system and the galaxy. Secondly, there is a prospect of finding uh, minerals on Mars, which may be scarce uh, on our own planet, but which could well be abundant there and would do uh, tremendous amounts of good for us to have. But the most exciting mineral of all, of course, is water. And we know that uh, there are abundant polar ice caps on Mars, which contain uh, enough water, I believe, to cover the whole surface of the planet to a depth of 35 meters. But what we don't know is just how much water is buried lurking beneath the surface. And of course, if we can find all this water, this leads us to the most exciting question, which was first posed in 1971 by the renowned astrophysicist David Bowie. Is there life on Mars? And of course, related to that, was there life on Mars? Was there millennia, millions and billions of years ago, uh, traces of uh, microbial life uh, and other exciting things which would lead us in the search of potentially extraterrestrial intelligence? I'm a information. Perhaps later. Uh, see me outside. Uh, but uh, <laughs> more, just as exciting as this, of course, is the ancillary discoveries which we would make along the way. Because so much of human progress has not come about uh, deliberately, but has come about as part of uh, larger and greater scientific projects. And what greater scientific project could there be than populating Mars itself? Uh, computers, for instance, uh, came on tremendously in their development 
as part of their use in the uh, space race in the 1960s. The World Wide Web was invented to help scientists at CERN doing particle physics. Uh, and notoriously, of course, in 1928, uh, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin entirely by accident while, stuff, uh, by, by, while, stu while studying types of bacteria. And we are already seeing this now in the sense that uh, our efforts to explore Mars and study it have forced us to make tremendous advantages in uh, laser communication technology, being trialed by NASA at the moment, in ultra high definition imaging, uh, and doubtless will lead us to make all sorts of discoveries which we cannot even imagine yet. But this debate, of course, is not just about exploring Mars, but about populating it. And I would encourage you to look beyond merely science and think about some of the philosophical and anthropological questions that that would allow us to explore. What does it mean to be human on a planet other than Earth? What sort of political and economic structures would we use? What does society even mean if we have the chance to redefine it with a fresh start? Because speaking of the fresh start, I fear that on this planet, a fresh start may well be one day what we need. The reality of climate change is that our blue planet is glowing red hot. By 2050, 80% of the Maldives may well be uninhabitable. And unless politicians act with much more uh, vigor and determination than they are doing at the moment, this damage will only accelerate and continue. Moreover, we have a rising population and diminishing natural resources. It took two million years for the population of humanity to reach one billion, and it only took 200 for it then to go up to seven billion. But I want to be clear that this is not about abandoning Earth. This is about recognizing that ultimately, Earth is finite, but space is practically infinite. And becoming a multi-planetary species is the only way that we are going to have, if you like, a species-level life insurance policy. And again, I want to clarify what this motion is and what this motion is not. Of course, we are not saying that we should all go to Mars tomorrow. Of course, the state of the technology and the state of our economy uh, is, is not in the place where we'd be able to do that. Uh, you know, the last year or two have been quite eventful, as you may remember, and we have uh, other things to be focusing on. And of course, there is a the fact that not everybody would want to go. I remember some years ago being on a flight uh, across the Atlantic and reading this tremendous novel, The Martian, uh, about an astronaut who was uh, left abandoned by his crew on Mars. And I was struck immediately with two important life lessons. Number one, there is no way I'm going to Mars unless both the technology and, frankly, the cuisine is uh, tremendously improved. Number two, of course, that it is seldom a good idea for children to read books about any form of aviation, space or otherwise, while passengers on a particularly turbulent aeroplane. <laughs> but what we are saying tonight is that we should make that investment, that commitment as a species into laying the long-term groundwork for the day when one day those who want to, those who are able to, could potentially go out and break that final frontier. Do not let them tell you that this is always going to be too difficult, that this is always going to be too expensive, that there is never going to be the impetus to do this. Because, of course, centuries ago, the idea that we could go to the moon, the idea, frankly, that you know, we could go to Australia was unfathomable beyond belief. But we do these things, as President Kennedy said, not because they are easy, but precisely because they are hard. From the, the Arctic to the Sahara, from the highest mountains to the lowest valleys, human beings have shown themselves capable of living in the most dangerous and remote and inhospitable places you could possibly imagine. And no, I'm not just talking about Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm tremendously encouraged by the strides we're already making in uh, research into technologies like terraforming, which would... Uh, give us the prospect of creating an Earth-like environment on Mars. And of course, that is not the only option, and that is not the only thing we are considering. Uh, but it was very good to see that even last year, MOXIE, the Mars Oxygen In-Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, uh, was able to produce for the first time oxygen out of carbon dioxide on the Martian surface itself. And I think it is also a fantastic thing that we have people like Alfredo Munoz, who we will hear later on, who are already thinking about questions like, what would a Martian city look like? How would we design it? I think that is a tremendously inspiring thing for us to have. But I want to end on what I think is a serious and an important acknowledgement. That, of course, the history of exploration on Earth has not always been a happy one. Many, many things have been done by past generations in the name of exploration, which today we rightly condemn. 
that when I look up at the stars in the night sky tonight, when I look indeed at the many stars here in this chamber, I am filled with a tremendous sense of optimism and I see an enormous opportunity for all of us here on this planet to work together truly in the name of exploration, not exploitation, to do things which we could only have imagined were possible. And yes, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Thank you so much.